We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for our neighbors. We're going to pray that God does great and mighty things. We're going to take our spiritual coronavirus shot in the arm, all right? You're going to be immune to that after today in Jesus' name, all right? So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have today to gather, God. Many of us gathered here on campus, Lord, spread out across the campus. Many of us gathered, Lord, in homes, God. We bless each and every home, every person that's watching online. God, we thank you, Lord, that right now, Father, that your presence permeates your church, God, worldwide, God, that the church is not shut down. We are open. We are declaring your praise, God. We are not backing down. We're moving forward, God. Bless all the pastors, God, who had to make some hard decisions this week very rapidly. Many of them lost the building that they were going to be in because the school shut down or the theater shut down. And Father, God, they had no place to go, even though they were under 250 people, God. They were forced to go online. But God, I thank Thank you, Lord, that they are not stopping, God, that they are moving forward, and Lord, that this will not halt their momentum, but that, God, you provide spiritual momentum for each and every one of those churches. Bless the pastors with special grace to preach the word of God like never before. Bless the church to pray like we've never prayed before. Bless us with unity like we've never had before, God. We thank you for impartations of your grace in this time and in this season, in this present distress, Lord. We look to you, God. You are awesome, and you are God alone, and Father, we thank you, Lord. Right now, come on, raise up an arm. Right now, we take our spiritual coronavirus immunization shot, Lord. We thank you, God, that we are immune to that disease, that it will not come near us or our family, our neighborhoods, our co-workers. We declare this coronavirus to be dead and halted on the planet in the name of Jesus. We thank you that you are Lord over all, God, and that, Father, you are the healer, Lord, and we give you praise and thanks for that in Jesus' name, Lord God. And, Father, as it's been declared, a national day of prayer, Lord. We thank you, God, that you bless our nation. You bless our leaders, God, the members of the, the, the presidential cabinet, God, all of the advisors, Lord. We bless our president, God, and our vice president, the leaders in the CDC and WHO, God, all of the health organizations of the county and the state level, God. We bless our governor, God, with wisdom, Lord. We pray, Father God, for all of our leaders to have the wisdom and the direction of God, to have godly counselors, wise people around them to help steer them in the way that you would have them to go. Lord, we pray for our neighbors and our neighborhoods, God, that people would not be bound by fear, but Father God, that the faith of your church would inspire and encourage them, Lord God, that food supplies would not stop and paper goods would not stop, Lord, that there would be abundance and blessing in our land, God, and we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this nation and in our midst, God. You are good. Now, Lord, as we open up your word, open it up to us. Open us up to receive it. God, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding, and may we be good ground where the word is sown today, God. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit teaching and leading your church. It's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement, we say... Amen, amen. All right. Today, have a seat. Get your Bibles out. And those of you that are online as well, I know oftentimes when you're watching online, you've got the device that you would normally use as your Bible watching the video. So go grab a physical Bible if you need to. Also minimize distractions. If your children are there watching with you, make sure that they watch. But also they might need a little coloring page to doodle as they listen because even my kids get tired after about a minute of me talking. And so that is probably true for your children as well. So make sure to minimize distractions today. Let's get into the word of the Lord. There are no accidents when it comes to the word of God and the timing of God. In fact, we've been in these verses going through the book of Colossians, and don't you know that God had already lined up this message for this weekend in these circumstances with these people listening to what God would have us to hear today. Colossians chapter 4, we've been in it, a series called The Lord's Work and Workforce. This is part number 3, and in Colossians chapter 4, I'm going to read to you verse number 7 down through verse number 12. Now, in the first part of the series, we read all the way through the end of the, the, the chapter. You're welcome to read that on your own later on, but for today's purposes. We're only going to go Colossians chapter 4, verse number 7 through verse number 12. Starting out in verse 7, it says this, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. Verse number 8, and I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. 
Next verse goes on in verse number nine. says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. We talked about him last week, if you remember. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Verse number 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, where of the circumcision they have proved to be a comfort to me. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, let me just refresh our memories today and remember some things that we've already spoken of in this series. First of all, is that we learned that those of us that are born of the Spirit of God, that we are the workforce, right? That we all have a part to play in doing the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord is not just reserved for pastors or people that are paid by the church. It's for all of the body of Christ. I'm going to ask a question. I want everybody here live. I want everybody in the foyer and all throughout the rooms on campus. I want those of you online to, when I ask this question, all right, to raise your hand up in the air and wave it like you just don't care. And I want you to give a big whoop and a holler and a woot, all right? How many full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ do we have today listening? Woo! All of us, right? Because we are the Lord's workforce. God chooses to use you and to use me to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Small things, when we do them in the name of God, when we start to be a part of the workforce, small things become great things. Secular things become sacred, and temporary things become eternal. And if you remember last time we were together, we made this statement that God's workforce should be helpful and encouraging. And we started to focus in on that word helpful, and we talked about being helpful with people's salvation, being helpful in practical ways. If you remember last week when we talked about the runaway slave that found the master, Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden, this unprofitable servant became so profitable and a beloved brother in the Lord. Today, I want to focus our minds and focus today's sermon on being encouraging, on being encouraging. You know what? Encouragement is lovely, isn't it? Don't you just love an encouraging person? You just want to be around them, right? Encouragement is loving, but encouragement is also like giving. Paul knew that Tychicus would be a comfort to the Colossians, so that's why he sent this guy, because he knew that he would be a comfort, that he would be an encouragement to them. Also, he looked at the prayers of Epaphras, and he was stirred enough to tell the people about him. He knew that they would be encouraged that somebody was in their corner, somebody was standing on their side, somebody was laboring and doing the Lord's work in prayer for them. Uh, finally, we see that he loved the faithfulness of Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice, and he felt comfort himself. It helped Paul, and it helped the church to go further than they could have gone on their own. Our founding pastor has taught us this over the years, and you'll remember the statement, most likely if you've been around the church for any period of time and heard him speak, that people will only go as far as they are encouraged. Let me say that again. Write that down if you're taking notes. People will only go as far as as they are encouraged. My dad is a prime example of this. I love my dad. He's a wonderful father to me and my brother. He's a wonderful husband to my mom and and just a great guy. Just awesome. My dad, as he grew up, was very gifted, and uh, I, I, I view him as on like genius level. The guy is ridiculous when it comes to computer systems and things like that. And he's also a very skilled and talented artist. He can draw photorealistic things with a pencil. The guy's very gifted. Growing up, he, we, he hung his pictures all around our house. And my dad's also a gifted musician. He taught me how to play guitar at a young age, and so I grew up on Leonard Skinner and Aerosmith and all the, the rock and roll greats of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I, you know, I'm kind of like Cola or you know one of those old stations, right? KCAL, that, that was my upbringing. And we learned all those songs on the guitar together. My dad could pick those things up and play by ear and just a wonderfully gifted man. But as he was growing up, he had a father who was a mean drunk. Some of you guys know what that's like. And he would often put him down. And when he would see my dad doodling and when he would see my dad drawing and he would see my dad's interest in music, he would say, those things don't pay. You're not going to make it in those areas. You need to just get a job like me at the phone company. My grandfather worked for Pac Bell. So my dad, as he grew up, believed that he could only work for Pac Bell, went out and got a job doing construction with Pacific Bell Company. Eventually that became GTE and that became Verizon. And my dad stayed with that career all throughout his lifetime and retired out of Verizon as a manager in that company. Once again, my dad's very gifted. He just had a never say no attitude, had a great work ethic, went after it and it elevated him and his interest in computers actually got him noticed and he became a a guy that led systems and different things, had nine computers in the middle of the night turning on in a room in an office building that turned on and put a report on his boss's desk. 
But what could God have done with this man if he had been encouraged by his father? What could God have done if he didn't have a, hey, those things won't pay, those things don't do well, you're not good enough, you're not one of the elite to get in. What if someone had come along and said, you know what, your art is great, you need to be doing more. What what if someone came along and said, that's awesome, why don't you explore pastels and paints and and why don't you go out into mixed media? What if somebody came along and said, your music is awesome, why don't you start writing, why don't you start doing, why don't you start teaching, man, you're great at this. What would my dad's life have been like if someone would have come along and rather than discourage him, encourage him and build him up. You know, my dad decided that he wasn't going to do to me and my brother what was done to him, and so he encouraged us. He told us, you can do anything that anyone else can do. You can be what you, you, you've been called to be. Anything that God tells you to do, you can go out and do it. You have the right mind to make decisions. He built us up as men of God. He encouraged us in the things that we were doing. A- any interest that we had, he'd go out. If he knew that we even looked at an instrument, he'd go and buy it, right? We had trumpets and trombones and drums and bass guitars and guitars and amplifiers, and when it came time for me to have a garage band, my dad was opening up the garage, polishing off the drum set, making sure everything was good to go for us. They drove me all around this entire Southern California area for my music. Man, they were at everything. They were ready to go. They encouraged my brother. My brother today is an occupational therapist with a master's degree. The guy is brilliant and is doing a great, wonderful job. But guess what else? I had other people in my life that encouraged me, not just my parents, but also my beautiful, wonderful in-laws. They are like the biggest cheerleaders on the planet. I believe that's why God planted them in San Bernardino to pastor. And they would always tell me, even though my messages stunk, they would say, Dan, that was the best word of God I've ever heard in my entire life. I'd be like, you're lying. You need to shame the devil. They'd be like, no, it was wonderful. You can do it, Dan. You're the best. You're a great pastor. You're a great leader. And because of the encouragement of the people around me, I've been able to go farther and not get discouraged and give up and quit because I have a network of people. Just this morning, I wish you guys could have read all the text messages going back and forth between pastors this morning because there's guys who had to shut down their church, but man, I was texting them, you're going to kill it today. It's going to be better. Grace is upon you today. I had people text me from all over the world this morning. Man, we're so encouraged that your doors are open. We're so excited for you, pastor. Listen, we need a network of encouragers around us because we will go farther with it. People will only go as far as they're encouraged. And we need to be helpful and encouraging with others. So how do we be an encourager? Today, this is a very simple message, but I believe that it will change your life. How? How do we be an encourager? First thing is this, is do what God would do. Anybody remember the bracelets that said WWJD? You guys remember that? What would Jesus do? That's a great question to ask, isn't it? And when you start to take a look at life and you see other people around you discouraged and broken down, walking around in the pits, man, my goodness, what would God do in those situations? Look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was magnetic. The guy was gravitatious. I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm going to use it. He, he had a gravity about him. People were drawn to Jesus. Why? Just because he did miracles and he fed masses? No, because he was encouraging. He was light giving. He was lovely. Oh my goodness, people wanted to be around Jesus. Why? Because he didn't condemn them to death. He loved them to life. Zacchaeus, you little tax collector man, get down out of that tree. We're having dinner at your house tonight. He was an encourager. And we need to take a look at what God did and do those same things. One of the names often mentioned in the New Testament we find here in Colossians chapter number four. Name Barnabas. Barnabas. In fact, that wasn't his real name. That was a nickname that was given to him by the apostles. Apparently, this man was so encouraging that the apostles said, your name's not, no, it's not Joseph. No. Your name is Barnabas. Barnabas means son, bar of encouragement. This guy was so encouraging. They said, you are the son of encouragement. How many of you know God is an encourager? Right? So when we see what God does and we do those same things, we become Barnabas. We become a son of encouragement. We're all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ, right? So when you do the works of God, you become that Barnabas. So here's my encouragement for you today. Be a Barney. Come on, you guys. That's not what I'm talking about. Or wait. Why is this big purple dinosaur so popular? 
I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Could it be that this big purple dinosaur got so popular because he was encouraging? I think so. And for all of us, maybe it's not such a bad thing to be a Barney like this, but even more so a son or a daughter of encouragement, going out and doing what God would have us to do. Barnabas was a true encourager. In fact, encouragers go out of their way and will even defend others. That's how much an encourager will go, is to go to the defense of someone else. How many of you have ever had someone defend you and it just built you up? It encouraged you. That's what Barnabas did. There was a guy by the name of Saul who was persecuting the church in the book of Acts. You know him by the name of Paul, the apostle. Before he had a meet up with Jesus, he was a terrorist. He was dragging people out of their homes. He had letters to go to Damascus and to terrorize the church. And so as he was going, he had an encounter with Jesus, had a guy by the name of Ananias start teaching some things out of the Bible. He gets saved, he gets baptized, he gets filled up with God, starts to preach. And then in Acts, the book of Acts, if you want to turn there with me, chapter number nine, verse number 26 through verse number 28, I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. Acts chapter number nine, starting verse 26, says this, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. The believers didn't believe that he was a believer. Oh my goodness. And so they stayed away from him. Rightfully so, this guy was terrorizing the church. He was the coat check guy when they were stoning Stephen to death. And so here they are, and they're going, no, I'm not going to get around this guy. He's going to beat me up. He's going to terrorize me. Verse 27, then Barnabas, Barney shows up, brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, where? In Damascus, the same place he was going to terrorize is the same place that he went and started to preach the word of God to. And so that showed the change that was in this man. Now look at what happens in the next verse because Barnabas defended Saul, verse number 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them. Did you realize that he just got VIP access? He just got upgraded, right? He just got a better seat in church because now all of a sudden, he's not just around the believers. He's getting trained by the apostles. Hey, watch this. Watch what happens when we preach. Hey, when you speak in the name of Jesus, people are going to get healed. There's a confirmation of the word of God. See, Saul had not walked with Jesus like these guys did, but now he's walking with these guys and he's getting on the job training. Look at the last part of the verse, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. They're like, hey, Saul, get up. You got this one, bro. Go ahead and preach, brother. We'll we'll say amen from the sidelines over here, right? All because a man by the name of Barnabas went and defended Saul. This was not an isolated incident, by the way. Barnabas found out about the church in Antioch was exploding. He went and he got Saul and brought him over there. Barnabas took Saul on missionary journeys together. Barnabas, actually, you'll find him. There was a time where Saul wanted to go, Paul wanted to go and visit all the churches And he says, hey, Barnabas, let's go and visit the churches. And Barnabas says, good, I'll go get John Mark. Now, John Mark was Barnabas' nephew the son of his sister. This is the same John Mark that wrote the gospel book that we know as Mark. And so he says, let me go get John Mark. And Paul says, no, John Mark, that guy abandoned us on our last missionary journey. Barnabas goes, it's okay. We're going to train him up. We're going to raise him up. We're going to encourage him. Paul says, no, he's no good. He's young. he's, He's dumb. He doesn't know what he's doing right now. This is just my interpretation, right? But the argument got so bad, the Bible says that they actually split up. Paul took Uh, Silas, and they went off on their direction, and Barnabas took John Mark, and they went off on their direction. Now, we don't really read too much about Barnabas after that in the book of Acts, but we do read the apostle Paul telling the Colossians, if Mark shows up, welcome him. He doesn't say shame him, keep him out, the kid's good for nothing. We find him in the book of Timothy, telling Timothy, hey, bring John Mark with you, because he's useful for me in ministry. Apparently, Barnabas encouraged John Mark to the point that Paul recognized this kid is not useless, this kid is useful, all because someone encouraged him. You ought to give the Lord a praise for that. So how to be encouraging? Number one, do what God would do. Second thing is this, is to give what you have been given. 
You know, we all have been encouraged. We all have things that when we think about them, things that we like, things that we get encouraged with, why not take that and give it to someone else? Because chances are, if it encourages you, it's going to encourage somebody else. Sometimes all we need to encourage someone is to look at what encourages us and give that to others. You should be encouraged that you're saved. You should be encouraged that you're healed. You should be encouraged that you're delivered. You should be encouraged that you're victorious. You should be encouraged that you're blessed and so much more. Share that blessing with someone else. God is good. You ever studied in, in nature the things that the animal kingdom does? It's amazing. Otters fall asleep holding hands because they don't want anyone to drift away. It's just sharing some encouragement. Emperor penguins, they all gather together in the midst of cold blast and storm. They gather close together and they all are moving like this to stay warm. And as they're, as they're circling around, you can see them up there. They're all circled together. And the ones on the outside, they're getting the coldest, right? But eventually they'll move their way into the center. And as they move into the center, they get warmed up and other ones take turns going to the outside. They mutually encourage one another. How about Canadian geese? You ever seen Canadian geese flying in that V formation? The one up front, every time he flaps his wings, it provides lift for the one behind him, and they flap their wings, and the one behind them, they provide lift for the one behind them, and all of them are working together. So the one in the way back, he's on easy street. But guess what the one in the back is doing? He's honking. Honk, 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 honk. You want to know why they do that? They're encouraging the guy up front. He's got the hardest job. And they're saying, go on, you can do it. Flap those wings, man. You're looking good up there. Keep going. Come on. Keep going. This is great. And when the one up front gets tired, he falls to the back and he gets easy street. But guess what? His job's not done. Now he's honk, honk, honk. You can do it. Honk, honk, honk. This is great. Honk, honk, honk. I appreciate you, bro. Honk, honk, honk. Come on. Come on. Encourage the one up front flapping right now. We ought to take what's been given to us and give it to someone else. Martin Luther in the year 18, uh, sorry, 1526 wrote, a letter called, Whether One May Flee from a Deadly Plague. I thought this was appropriate for this weekend. And it contains this excerpt. He says, because we know that it is the devil's game to induce such fear and dread, we should in turn minimize it and take such courage as to spite and annoy him and send those terrors right back to him. We should arm ourselves with this answer to the devil. Get away, you devil, with your terrors. Just because you hate it, I'll spite you by going the more quickly to help my sick neighbor. No, you shall not have the last word. If Christ shed his blood for me and died for me, why should I not expose myself to some small dangers for his sake and disregard this feeble plague? If you can terrorize, Christ can strengthen me. If you can kill, Christ can give life. If you have poison in your fangs, Christ has far greater med medicine. Should not my dear Christ with his precepts, his kindness, and all his encouragement be more important in my spirit than you, roguish devil, with your false terrors in my weak flesh? God forbid! bid. Get away, devil. Here is Christ, and here am I, his servant in this work. Let Christ prevail. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 in the New Living Translation says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. We ought to be thinking about those things that have encouraged us and then start to stir up other people with those same things. Verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together. That's why our doors are open and we'll stay open. We're not going to neglect it. We answer to God first, as some people do. But encourage one another. Don't beat up on somebody that stayed home in the live stream today encourage them. I'm glad that you got to church. I'm glad that you got online. I am blessed that we all got the message together. I'm glad that we're a part of the family together. Come on, let's not break down the church. Let's build up the church and encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Last thing is this, last thing is this, is that we need to speak faith. Faith is the greatest encouragement that you can ever give to anybody. And now, more than ever, we need the church to rise up and to declare the will of God. We need to speak faith. How do you speak faith? Say what God would say. Don't say what the world is saying. Oh, it's, this is getting bad. It's only going to get worse. There's not going to be anything. Everyone's going to die. Oh, my God. Don't be speaking that foolishness and that foulness. That's not from God. God. 
We need to rise up and declare what God says. This is the day that the Lord has made and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. By his stripes, I am healed. No weapon formed against me or my family, my community, my block, my church shall prosper in the name of Jesus. A 10,000 may fall my side, 1,000 my right hand. It shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked. I will not fear the arrow that flies by day nor the terror of night. No plague shall come near my dwelling for I rest in the shadow of the Almighty and I dwell in the shelter of the Most High God. Hebrews 10, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, 13 and 14 in the message, we're not keeping this quiet. Not on your life. Just like the psalmist wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe, and what we believe is that the one who raised up the master, Jesus, will just as certainly raise us up with you alive. Somebody ought to say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Come on, let the chapel shout. Let the youth auditorium shout. Let the love rock shout. Let every house church gathering shout. Keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Don't sit down yet, don't sit down yet. If you're not on your feet yet, get to your feet. Come on, even at home, get up on your feet right now. We're gonna make a declaration because how do we be an encourager? Do what God would do. Give what you've been given and speak faith. We're gonna speak faith right now. Come on, I want you guys to repeat this faith declaration right after me today. See, I do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Jesus heals me. He delivers me, and he leads me. I will be helpful and encouraging. I stand in the gap for our world to be saved, delivered, healed, and blessed like I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give the Lord a great big praise.